1500s, European countries wanted to find a different trade route to Asia. Portugal had taken over the sea route just around Africa, and the land route was simply just too dangerous. Well, we'll be setting off to sea with them in today's Bumblebee video to experience the top 10 scary discoveries from the age of exploration. Let's start off big, quite literally. Number 10 will be the Patagonian giant. As you'll soon learn, the Europeans concocted many stories of debatable origins when exploring remote and exotic places, because why not? Nobody else had ever been there except them, so if they want to say there was an island full of dog-faced men or one-eyed people, which is a real thing one chronicler tried to claim, then they could. The story of the Patagonian giants is a great example of this that's still dicey in history. It comes from the famous Ferdinand Magellan expedition, which was his attempt at being the first explorer to have circumnavigated the globe. Ferdinand was not, in fact, the first to do so, but that'll be a later point in the video. So, in the 1520s, near today's coast of Porto San Julian, Argentina, Ferdi and his crew were anchored when, to quote their chronicler Antonio Pigafetta, we saw a giant who was on the shore, quite naked, who danced, leapt, and sang. Our captain sent one of the men towards him, charging him to leap and sing like the other in order to reassure him and show him friendship. They were able to interact with the man, and they met a few others of these giants, all of which were proclaimed to be over eight feet tall. After befriending these giants, Magellan supposedly tricked one of them into boarding a ship and stole the man. The giant was later baptized and named Paul, but he died during the fleet's long crossing of the Pacific Ocean. Historians believe that the giants were a member of Telehuche, which was a naturally tall native to southern Chile and Argentina. The voyage that the poor giant died during would have been, as said, across the Pacific Ocean, which is number nine. Vasco Nunes de Balboa of Spain had been in the New World for years, including an unsuccessful stint as a planter and pig farmer in Hispaniola. To escape debtors there, he stowed away in a barrel with his dog on a ship. Somehow, through a matter of a few years, he goes from being a loser sharing a barrel with a wet dog to Adventure Balboa of Spain, leader of expeditions off to find gold for the Spanish crown. Balboa, on his conquest, established the first stable settlement on the South American continent of Derry and Panama. While arguing about shocker, gold with one of his homies, an indigenous community member over years, and I guess he was about up to here with colonizer crap that day. Because he explained, if you are so hungry for gold that leave your lands and cause strife in those of others, I shall show where you can quell this hunger. Ooh. So anyways, this badass dude told Balboa of a place where people drank out of goblets of gold, but warned that a thousand men would be required to conquer clans living inland and along the coast and the other sea. Despite the manpower, supply, and brain cell shortage, Balboa departed on September 1st, 1513, to attempt this. On September 25th, he reached a summit from where he saw a vast ocean as the man had described. Balboa triumphantly waded into the water, raised his sword, and claimed the new sea and all adjoining lands for Spain. A bit presumptuous, no? If you want to hear more about historical power and greed, Bumblebee covers quite a bit of it, so be sure to take a second to subscribe to The Hive. And since we're talking about the ocean and traveling it, let's do how bad sea life was for number eight. So, life was pretty difficult for a sailor in the age of exploration. To give you an idea, journeys could take years. Ships only covered about 100 miles a day, and the pay was poor. For example, the crew on Columbus's journey only made $10 a month in today's money. And these crews worked around the clock in shifts minding the ship. Disobedience of any kind led to harsh punishments from captains, but then each captain would have different rules for their ship. You're better off seasick than hungry, though, that's for sure. Sailors only consumed about 3,000 calories a day, which they got from one pound of salted beef or pork. If meat rations are low, then you could expect the comfort food classic that makes us all think of mom and warm hug. Flour mixed with fat. You get one lib of hardtack, which, don't worry, was infested with weevils and bugs, but you can eat those as additional food, two for one, guys. Vitamin deficiencies naturally gave men scurvy, rotted teeth and gums, open sores, and even mental breakdowns. It was common to lose 50% of a crew to that disease alone. But if the diet didn't kill you, there were plenty of other things that could. Sailors had set, had one set of clothes that were rarely washed because they sought dirt and grease provided protection from wind and rain. Lice, rodents, and foul drinking water spread typhoid. Ships could be dangerously cold, and fires were only allowed in calm weather. But then the lack of fresh air below deck could still cause carbon poisoning. And what was discovered to be of use on this journey was the Columbian Exchange. Point number seven. The Columbian Exchange refers to the exchange of diseases, food crops, and populations between the new and the old world following the voyage to the Americas by Christopher Columbus in 1492. During this time, new metal supplies, both precious and functional, are discovered and exchanged. The old world gained new staple crops, such as tomatoes, chilies, cacao, peanuts, and pineapples, which are now culinary centerpieces in many old 
world countries, namely Italy, Greece, India, Korea, and more. Tobacco, another new world crop, was so universally adopted that it even became a substitute for currency in places. The exchange not only brought gains though, it also brought massive losses as you would later discover. Dolvins writes that before the invasion of peoples in the new world by pathogens that evolved among the inhabitants of the old world, Native Americans lived in relatively disease free environments. Before Europeans initiated the Colombian exchange of germs and viruses, the peoples of the Americas suffered no smallpox, no measles, no chickenpox, no influenza, no typhus or parathoid fever, no diphtheria, no cholera, no bubonic plague, no scarlet fever, no whooping cough, and no malaria. That is a pretty awesome track record, so go indigenous Americans. That no bathing habits of Europeans had brought diseases to a previously isolated community that had no disease immunity, causing devastation beyond that even of the Black Death in 14th century Europe. On the subject of disease, a terrifying one was discovered during this age. Number six is itchy and burning. While there's an obvious grocery list of diseases that the old world brought to the new, there were very few examples of diseases being spread from the new world to the old. Except the one main exception, syphilis, listed as one of the 12 diseases that changed our modern world. While it's pretty tame now, back in the 15th or early 16th century, fatal. And it was ugly fatal too. Warts, ulcers, rash, tumors, dementia, then bam, dead. It evolved over time to become pretty benign by the 17th century, more how it is nowadays. But society is still pretty stumped on where the origins of the disease are, leaving it to two theories. The Colombian hypothesis suggests that Columbus and his crew picked it up in Hispaniola, where the indigenous peoples had a natural immunity to it but passed it through intimate contact. Upon returning to Spain, some of the crew joined the campaign of Charles VIII of France and laid siege to Naples in 1495. They exposed the local populations of working girls, which amplified the disease's transmission. The second theory, the pre-Columbian hypothesis, asserts that the disease had always existed in the old world, and during their conquest, something in the new environment triggered a more severe reaction of it. It's very possible the reason there was no accounts of syphilis before the 1490s is because beforehand they couldn't differentiate it from other diseases with similar symptoms. Regardless, within five years of its arrival, the disease was viral in Europe. Syphilis reached Hungary and Russia by 1497, Africa, the Middle East, and India by 1498, China by 1505, Australia by 1515, and Japan by 1569. And that population devastation leads to the worst of mankind, which is number five. Regarded as a glorious era by Europeans, it couldn't be anything less of a nightmare for African and indigenous populations, who were the largest sacrifice of this conquest. The disease killed the indigenous peoples too quickly for the colonizers liking. Upwards to 80 to 95% of the indigenous population was gone within the first 100 to 150 years following 1492. They had been using us for forced labor and the colonizers weren't about to farm their own land or build their own houses and now there's labor shortages. So they decided to steal people from another continent. A demand for labor was met with the stealing and forced movement of over 12 million Africans during the 16th to 19th century. The first transatlantic voyage delivering captured African peoples to the new world, specifically Brazil, was completed in 1526. They would become the first of the estimated 4.9 million Africans transported to Brazil over the ensuing three plus centuries, more than any other country in the world. To give a comparison, about 400,000 were shipped directly to North America. Often overlooked is the role of new world forced laborers. Whether it was indigenous or African, it went well past agriculture. Yes, it's planting and harvesting coffee, tobacco, coca, sugar, and cotton, but it's also the dangerous mining of precious metals, cutting timber for ships, constructing infrastructure, and domestic servants. The oppression of these two groups, their cultures and religious beliefs has led to damage we're still undoing. Intergenerational traumas, political battles, social rejection, the list goes on. Education on this subject, no matter how uncomfortable it may be to hear sometimes, is absolutely crucial. Number four, we take a look into the monstrous maps they used to navigate these high seas. The soldiers, sailors, and merchants, and other adventurers who adventured into uncharted seas and land encountered beasts they'd never seen, lush and even frightening landscapes, and heard tales of mysterious people and their ways. Many of these experiences found their way onto the maps describing the new land. Cardiographical researcher Chet Van Duzer explains that monsters began to appear on maps for a variety of reasons. One being that cartographers fear of horror vacu, aka blank space, on the map. They filled in unknown spaces of uncharted land with artistic renderings of animals, plants, angels, and other things. Another reason was that artwork enhanced the map's visual appeal. Cartographers and their artists often made up creatures to increase the excitement of the map and in turn increase sales. If cartographers did not know what was in a particular area but assumed or had heard from sailors and other travelers stories that it was most likely dangerous, they'd make sure to X mark that spot with the demonic deity doodle. 
Dory Klein of the Boston Public Library explains that people didn't really know what was out there and their corpus of knowledge came from folklore and the Bible. In that world, monsters could very well be real and they were just part of this supernatural landscape. The beasties took on many forms, physical, geographical, and fantastical. Maps of unknown lands of the globe were marked with volcanoes and shipwrecks and megafauna, and winged beasts, treacherous shores, leviathans, horned creatures, and giant squids. And it was on many maps you could find the Mystery King, who will be number three on the countdown. The motivation behind about 90% of the Portuguese exploration that inaugurated the Age of Discovery was the one mysterious dude named Prester John. Not to be that guy, but that literally sounds like a name made up on the spot. And that's what people have been trying to figure out for centuries. Was this guy real? The Portuguese hoped to find this legendary, immensely wealthy king who was rumored to rule over an advanced Christian kingdom in the east, as they wanted to form an alliance with him against the Muslim crusaders. Rumor of the king's rule circulated from a letter sent to the Emperor of Rome in 1177 from a man named Prester, whose letters described how his crime-free peaceful kingdom was being besieged by barbarians, and he needed the help of the Christian European armies. In 1177, Pope Alexander III sent his friend Master Philip to find Prester John, but he never did. By the 14th century, exploration had proved Prester's kingdom was not in Asia and turned to Africa, but once again they found nothing. The legend lived on as cartographers continued to include the kingdom of Prester John on maps throughout the 17th century, and the Spanish continued to send voyages to seek out the man and his potentially mythic kingdom. Though some scholars think the basis for Prester John came from the great empire Genghis Khan, others conclude it was merely fantasy. Either way, Prester John profoundly affected the geographical knowledge of Europe by stimulating interest in foreign lands and sparking expeditions outside of the country. And speaking of mysterious lands, here's the story of how Magellan's voyage ended. It's number two. Although it was never officially part of his mission and it cost zero dollars to mind his own business, Magellan took great pains to convert all the indigenous people he encountered to Christianity by whatever means necessary as usual. The most notable example came in April of 1521 in the Philippines where he baptized King Humagon of Cebu along with thousands of his subjects. Magellan's religious fervor became so strong by the time he'd reached the country, he threatened to kill chieftains that resisted converting to Christianity and making their community do so as well. When a king named Lapu Lapu refused to convert, Megalan's men barricaded families into their home and burnt the village on the island of Makan. Megalan, determined to have his way, later returned to the island with 49 men and demanded Lapu Lapu yield to his authority. The king refused, disgusted and fed up, and decided it was throwdown time. Megalan has killed just so fast. He's struck by a spear and then descended upon by a mob of islanders that hack him to death. In the Philippines, where he's remembered accurately as a tyrant, the Battle of Mactan is reenacted every April 27th. His sudden death is the reason Magellan cannot be cited as the first man to circumnavigate the globe. While he organized the voyage and negotiated the treacherous South American Strait across the Pacific, credit for the successful trip should also go to the mariner Juan Sebastian Elcano, who commanded the return voyage of the Victoria. And now for number one, I'd say one of the scariest discoveries is explorers and their eerie ending. So obviously, I'd, I just told you about Magellan, there's gonna be some more. Encouraged by the Spanish crown to discover more islands, Ponce de Leon followed rumors that he had heard from indigenous Puerto Ricans about an island called Vimini, home to a magical spring whose waters kept you youthful forever. It led him to Florida, where he failed to find the fountain of youth, but a poison arrow found his thigh. Remember Balboa, who's found an ocean as if they're hard to miss? Well, Vasco Balboa died because he was feuding with his boss, governor of Darien, Petty Deras, who had taken Balboa's title a little after he'd fallen out of the king's favor. These two couldn't sort out their differences, even when Balboa became Petty Deras' son-in-law. The man's jealousy led to him having Balboa arrested and imprisoned on false charges of rebellion. He was very quickly tried for treason against the crown, found guilty, and beheaded on January 21st of 1519. Giovanni de Veranzo, a French explorer, was the first European to sight New York. He had his final voyage in 1528 when he sailed with his brother from Dieppe to Florida, the Bahamas, and finally the Lesser Antilles. Here, he anchored off one of the islands, apparently Guadeloupe, went ashore, and was immediately captured and killed by an indigenous colony who, let's say, had a very filling dinner that night. February 1779, Captain James Cook, the great English explorer, is killed by native Hawaiians during his third visit to the Pacific Island group. While they were welcomed the first two times, the second time had brought disease that had killed the Hawaiians en masse. So when they showed up the third, they were not very welcome. And of course, one of the most famous stories this is how Hudson's crew set him adrift on what's now Hudson's Bay because he wouldn't cut him a break. He's loaded up into a dinghy with crew members that you've given special treatment to and none of them are ever seen or heard from again. Alrighty, thank you so much for your time. I sure hope you enjoyed it. Be take some time to hit the like and subscribe button. And even though it's nowhere near close to relevant to this topic, happy Barbie and Oppenheimer release day. I'll see y'all in the theaters.